in the field. So this will be our agenda. We will start with an introduction, uh, some background, and that might take a bit of time. And we'll define what is quantum communication. And then we will come to the different examples of quantum communication, the different protocols like quantum teleportation, super dense coding, BB84, and some of our work, which we have done in our lab, like W-state encoding, and some of the industry technolo technologies, which are right now the hottest areas, like quantum key distribution. And we will discuss the future prospects also. So uh, I think you're all familiar with what is a qubit. Every discussion on quantum information starts with defining a qubit. A qubit is a basic building block of what you say of quantum information. It is actually the analog version. I mean, the classical, just like you have classical bit in the classical information theory or classical communication, we have the quantum bit in the quantum information as well as quantum computing. So it is a quantum version of classical bit. So abbreviated as qubit. So here the zero becomes Dirac zero, one becomes Dirac one. And what makes it peculiar from a classical bit is that it can also be in a superposition. Like it can be one and zero at the same time. So what actually uh, lies at the fund foundation of this one? So qubit is basically treated as, uh, they are right now in our treatment, we treat them as ab abstract mathematical objects. So they can have like two classical states, two states like a classical bit. And these states can be in a linear combination of any state, these two states. And we call them superposition. So we, I mean, it is denoted by uh, Dirac psi, which is alpha 0 plus beta 1, where alpha and beta are complex numbers. So in a sense, state of a qubit is a vector in a two-dimensional complex vector space. Here, 0 and 1, we take as computational basis states or orthonormal basis states for their vector space. So we cannot examine to determine a quantum state. That is, we cannot exactly determine the value of what is alpha and beta. But when we measure a qubit, we get either 0 or 1 with a probability of alpha square and beta square. Obviously, they both should add to 1. So mathematically, we can represent them as psi is equal to e raised to i gamma cos theta, theta by 2, 0, e raised to i phi sine theta by 2, 1. I mean, that's a complex expression. So this experiment is done in so that we can visualize a qubit in a three-dimensional space. So this is actually nothing but a tool of visualization. We call it a block sphere. You can see on the left side of the slide. I'm going a bit fast because I think most of you are familiar with the topic, and this might have been already discussed in a few of the presentations which happened. So qubit states can be manipulated, and they can be transformed in ways which can lead to measurement outcomes. That is. Even though you cannot exactly determine the value of alpha and beta, you can always measure a qubit and get the value 0 and 1. So that is our basic principle which we had to keep in mind. So, I'm sorry. And you said that qubit is an arbitrary, it's a counterpart of the classical bit, which can take two states, 0 and 1. But when we treat them as abstract mathematical objects, there is no limitation that we have to stick to the log number 2 or we had to stick to binary logic. So we can here also go to higher dimensional logic, like Q dits. Like if I choose 3 as a uh, ortho as a basis, we can call it Q trit. We can have three states. We will denote them by 0, 1, and 2. Similarly, we can choose state 4, state 5, up to 10, and any number. So in general, they are known as Q dits, or higher dimensional logic, or D-level systems. So just now, we discussed about block sphere which can actually visualize a qubit, there is no visual representation of a qubit. You cannot visually represent them, or you cannot imagine them in your mind. And why qubits is, uh, right now the engineers of the field, they think that qubit might be a solution to the low data rate which quantum communication is now facing. So even though quantum communication is right now being getting more and more importance and replacing the classical communication. No. So to replace a classical communication or to be, to take the place of the current classical communication, we have to overcome the classical communication in terms of data rate, error correction, etc. A lot of other things. So one of the fundamental limitations of quantum communications right now is its low data rate. So if we use qubits, qubits instead of qubits, we can actually encode more information per bit or sorry, per ditch so that we can actually encode pack more data into that, which will require more complicated error correction techniques, obviously. 
but qudits uh, the research on qudits is in a very preliminary stage and it holds a promise of solving the data at issue and just like we said a single qubit can be visualized using a multi i mean a block sphere there is no visual representation for multiple qubits if you think more than one qubit you cannot visualize it so there is a limit to how you can visualize a n dimensional vector space because of that now let us uh, go to uh, yeah please if you have uh, any doubt uh, just one request uh, yeah. some of the attendees had requested for the presentation slides yeah so sure i, I uh, I can send them afterwards because I think I need to add a couple more references to the slides. The rough everything is okay. 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 So I can send to them after the uh, presentation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in between, if you are not able to follow or if you feel that I'm going a bit fast, please feel free to interrupt me. The initial part, I'm going a bit faster because I think this more of most of these are repetition of the previous talks happened. So uh, once we define qubits, like uh, the quantum bits. The next obvious part comes the gates, how you manipulate these qubits to do computing as well as communication operations. There are a lot of quantum gates which has been discussed. And in a, a quantum gate, in math mathematically, they are just nothing but a unitary matrix. Or any unitary matrix is a quantum gate. Uh, I am not just going to the area of quantum gates right now, but I am just introducing two very important type of quantum gates, which we will discuss in course of this. Uh, talk. So one such gate is Hadamard gate. And uh, sorry, Hadamard gate, imagine a qubit uh, on the left side. Like Im imagine the qubit is in state zero. That is, uh, the vector is pointing in the positive z direction. So that is state zero. Now, if you apply an identity gate, an identity gate actually does nothing to a qubit. It leaves the qubit as it is. So the output will be the same vector pointing towards the positive z direction. And now, if you apply x gate, which is actually called a not gate, what it will do is it will just reverse the vector. Now the vector will point, once you apply the x gate, the vector will point in the uh, negative z direction, or it will point in the 1. That is the 1. So if you apply not gate, Dirac 0 becomes Dirac 1. Or if you apply x gate to 1, it becomes 0. That is, it just reverses the vector. Okay. So that is the basic uh, two basic gates, like identity gate and uh, node gate. The Hadamard gate does something more interesting. It actually takes the vector. Suppose, I mean, consider this particular vector as the input one. So this particular qubit as the input one, where it is pointing in the zero direction. So our qubit is zero. We apply a Hadamard gate. What the gate will do is, it will take the vector exactly between zero and one. That is, uh, towards the positive x direction. 0 plus 1 by root 2. So from a deterministic state, it moved into a random state. What does it mean? Now, uh, value of alpha is 1 by root 2, value of beta is 1 by root 2, which means if you measure the qubit, you will get 0 with a probability 1 by 2 and 1 with a probability 1 by 2. That is, you measure the qubit, you get either 0 or 1 with equal probability. So initially, the qubit was a deterministic qubit. Whatever, I mean, whatever measurement, if you measure it, you will get zero. But once you apply the Hadamard gauge, it became a randomized qubit. Now, if you measure it, you will, you will get either zero or one with equal probability. So this is what Hadamard gate does. Now, if you apply the Hadamard gate to again, that is, now the vector is pointing in the positive x direction. Now, if you apply the Hadamard gate again, what will happen? You will again take it to zero or one. So the randomized qubit now becomes a deterministic qubit. That is the action of the Hadamard gate. Now let us look at the equation. This is how it is. Hadamard applied to 0, it becomes 1 by root 2, 0, plus 1 by root 2, 1. That is represented by that plus sign. And if you apply Hadamard to 1, it becomes 1 by root 2, 0, minus 1 by root 2, 1. What does that minus sign means? Nothing. It just takes it to the negative x direction, pointing to the negative x direction. That's all. So again, if you apply this Hadamard gate again to the uh, gate, ag again to the output, it again takes it back to the input stage, to the 0, to the 1. Okay, so that is a very interesting type of gate which doesn't have a counterpart in the classical gates. It's a typical quantum gate. There is no classical Hadamard gate. Like when we say about a not, like just now I said about, talked about not gate. You have a classical not gate and now you have a quantum not gate. 
you know the difference right now i mean just i explained but in a hadamard gate there is no classical hadamard gate there is only quantum hadamard gate and here comes the second type of gate which i want to introduce in this talk that is controlled not gate or c not gate controlled not gate is similar to what is a not gate in a classical circuit but here you have an extra line called as a control line it means that if the control line is 1 the gate does the inversion the control line is 0 there is no inversion the input line pass as it is so the difference between a hadamard gate and a c not gate is hadamard gate is a single qubit gate and there are, there are two classes of gates actually single qubit gates and multi qubit gates single qubit gates act on single qubit like the input will be a single qubit while multi qubit gates they take multiple qubits as input and c not gate is an example of a multiple qubit gate which is actually two in, i mean they work on two qubits so there will be a control qubit x and a and a Uh, input qubit y. So just like I said, when x equal to zero, the y just passes as it is. There is no change in y. When x becomes one, the y is inverted. Now, if you look at the output, you can see that it is nothing but an XOR gate. So the to translate the C not gate into our classical language or the classical uh, uh, information theory, we just need to imagine an XOR gate with an extra control line. that is the x is taken in the outside that's all so these two gates we will use quite a bit during the uh, later part of the talk now another prerequisite which we require to understand the quantum communication is a new concept known as quantum entanglement you might have heard this already so it is like two people tossing a coin at two different locations we have seen this in movies actually i mean two guys two people getting entangled as a comedy so it is like imagine there are two coins which are entangled now the i give the two coins to two people ask them to go to two different locations this can be anywhere it can be two part of the planet or it can be one in the earth and other in the jupiter or some part of the universe but if the coins are entangled you know the tossing of a coin output is completely random but if one person tosses a coin the his output already determines the output of the other person like if i toss a coin and i get hit my counterpart if he tosses a coin he should also get hit i mean It need not be head can be tail also that depends upon the entanglement in between so what we can say should be correlated in both locations the output will be correlated if you if one exp, one uh, coin is tossed that already de determines the output of the other how this information is transmitted from one point to another point we don't know the answer okay this actually violates the theory of relate i mean the einstein theorem basically einstein actually put forward this uh, as a thought exercise to prove that quantum mechanics is not complete but later this experiment was performed in the lab and was found quantum entanglement exists and now we keep using them uh, for many of the quantum computing computing as well as communication applications so definition is non local correlations exhibited by a set of qubits need not be two you can you can entangle multiple qubits and if you write the mathematical expression you cannot express them as a product of states like you cannot factorize them that's how mathematically you verify whether a state is entangled or not so an example of a entangled state is bell states bell states we call them as maximally entangled states or the maximum and this is how and the circuit below shows how a bell state is prepared so the h denotes the hadamard gate and c not and the next gate is c not gate so what it does is we input a qubit 0 to the hadamard gate first and then a qubit and then the output of the hadamard gate along with another zero qubit is fed to the c not gate or the control line of c not gate is the output of a hadamard gate so what will happen the zero passes through the hadamard gate and it becomes zero plus 1 by root 2 which we have already seen now the second qubit since uh, the first qubit is zero the second qubit doesn't change right it stay as it is so the first qubit is zero zero here in the uh, on the right hand side the first uh, in inside the dirac bracket you see zero zero the first zero denotes the topmost one the input of the hadamard tile the second zero denotes the second cube the second uh, input of the c not gate so again one one the first one denotes the input of the hadamard line uh, sorry the output of the hadamard line second one denotes the input to the c not gate so the zero becomes zero one by root 2 so second zero Since the first one is zero, second zero remains as it is. 
But since the first one is 1, the, one get, the 0 gets inverted and becomes 1. So now the total state of the two qubits is 0, 0 plus 1, 1 by root 2. As I told you, we cannot split them into two, split them into two. So that's why we know that they are entangled. So this is a circuit which actually generates an entangled qubit. Or, so here we give two qubits into the circuit and we get them as entangled qubits. And this is called maximally entangled. We can substitute 0 with 1. We can try the different combinations, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, etc. And we will get entanglement accordingly. So these four states are known as Bell states. And in most of the communication protocols, uh, this will be used as resource states. Uh, somebody has raised a hand. Yeah, please. Yeah, suppose uh, these are two qubits, right? Uh, yeah. So both qubits are computed in a computational basis, right? So suppose yeah. if we assume uh, 0, 0 plus 1, 1 instead, we assume 0 plus plus 1 plus. So they are considered no, we two tangled or not? Uh, I didn't get the question. Could you please repeat? We have two qubits, zero yes. and zero. first is computed in a zero one basis, and second is computed in plus minus basis. Oh, see, when we apply a circuit, we have to stick to one computational basis. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, we cannot actually input one zero. I mean, that actually causes many problems. I mean, we'll come to it later. I mean, that's a much much more complicated uh, uh, scenario. Okay, sure. But here, actually, we consider and uh, qubits in the same computational basis. Okay. Okay, so these are the four bell states which we, uh, which we are also known as maximally entangled states. So now another concept which we are required to work on quantum communication is no cloning theorem. That is, without measure, I mean, you know that once you measure a quantum state, it, the, it collapses into classical state. So that is one problem with the quantum quantum bit. If you measure a qubit, it becomes a classical bit, like the wave function collapses into either zero or one. Like once you get that zero and one, you cannot go back to the previous unknown state. So without measuring a qubit, you cannot make a copy of that. That is physically impossible. I mean, that is known as the no cloning theorem. So it is impossible to make the copy of a unknown quantum state. So these are the prerequisites which we require to understand what is quantum communication. So basically quantum communication is like the counterpart of the classical communication. It exploits the quantum nature of the objects to represent information. You will have a source, detector, channel, noise, use dropper, but the whole system will have quantum properties. So, and how do you represent information? There are different ways, like that depends, that's an engineering question. You can choose either current or voltage levels, or you can cho choose the spin of an electron, or if you choose photons, you can choose the different properties of photon. The most common method is to use the polarization of photon, and in the experiment which we are doing, we use the angular momentum of photons for, to represent quantum information. So that is basically the choice of the designer. So channel can be free space, optical fiber, gravitational space. Anything which can have a quantum property can be used as a channel. The effectiveness and the efficiency of the channel, that's a different question. That, again, it's an engineering problem. Now let us discuss another, the most common type of quantum communication, or one of the most misinterpreted words, quantum teleportation. So you are already, I think people who are not even familiar with quantum information might be familiar with the term quantum teleportation. It has been used a lot in the literature and the popular culture. Like you appear from one, I mean, you appear in one place and disappear from there and reappear in some other place, just like that. Yeah, technically it is like that, but not like what you see in the movies. So let us say we have two, two parties, Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob, they are two quantum physicists, or they know quantum physics, they know how to make quantum entanglement. So imagine they are working in a, in a quantum optics facility or a quantum optics laboratory. They Together, they make an entangled state, just like we saw. They make a bell state using a Hadamard gate and a CNOT gate. They make a bell state. And Alice and Bob take the pit, I mean the bell state, one each, they take, take, take them with them. So now the movie starts like the title rolls, and the movie cuts to the present tense. And when the movie is in the present tense, the, what you see is, Bob, you see only Alice. So Bob is hiding somewhere. We don't know the location of Bob. And now Alice got a mission. She has to send Bob an unknown qubit. And the problem is, 
there is no quantum channel between alice and bob but there is a classical channel between alice and bob she can send classical bits to bob so should she accept the mission or not that's a mission impossible question so this is how quantum teleportation comes into the picture they do have a pair of bell state which they prepared with each other i mean one one with each other is bell state pair which they prepared and they have one of them now alice has an unknown qubit the problem is alice cannot measure the qubit because once she measure the qubit it's a classical qubit right the quantum information is lost so this quantum information has to be sent to bob without loss she cannot copy it we know there's a no cloning theorem which actually prohibits the copying of an unknown qubit and even if she imagine somehow she transmitted the she transferred the quantum information to classical information again there's a problem you know that quantum information one bit of qubit is equal to infinite number of qubits sorry one bit of qubit is equal to infinite number of classical bits so she cannot actually use that classical channel also effectively to send the information to bob so again the question is back should she accept the mission or not yes the answer is quantum teleportation what she does is she already has a qubit with her which she prepared along with bob years before assume that that bit stays as it is there is no quantum decoherence so she takes that particular qubit and interacts her qubit with her half of qubit pair this phi is the unknown qubit which she has to transfer to bob she takes that qubit and she interacts that this qubit with her half of the qubit pair and then she measure it and once she measure it you know that the two qubits will become two classical bits there are four possibilities 0 0 0 1 1011 and now these classical bits she sends to bob because there is a classical channel between alice and bob so when bob receives the classical bit depending upon which he performs one of the four operations on his unknown qubit because unknown qubit is a original qubit bob has which he prepared with alice long back so depending upon the received classical bits bob performs one of the four operations on his unknown qubits and like magic bob's unknown qubit becomes alice qubits phi which she wanted to transfer to him so now alice has transferred her qubit to bob without transferring the qubit physically this is what quantum teleportation is all about this is not like uh, the purana serials were one person appears from one disappears from one place and appears in the other no the information only transfers through some way we don't know how it is so this is a circuit which actually does the first two qubits belong to alice the first two lines belong to alice the second one belong, the last one belongs to bob so alice uh, sends a here we assume that the bell state which alice and bob prepared is 00 0. okay the resource state is 00 0. that's we assume so how does it look like in real life suppose we realize this thing in the laboratory i mean this has been implemented and tested in laboratory for decades now people are trying to do this from earth to satellites so how does it look like in a laboratory it looks like this it's pretty complicated right yeah so all these equipments and all this complicated machinery to transfer one photon from one end of the bench to the other end of the bench that's what quantum teleportation is not as easy as been or as funny as we sound so what it does is it transfers one qubit with the help of with by transmitting two classical bits so quantum information is transferred with classical information that is basically quantum teleportation now there is something which does the reverse that is super dense coding so super dense coding is actually the reverse of class quantum teleportation so it allows to communicate two bits of classical information by sending a single qubit that is alice can send one qubit to bob but with one qubit to bob by sending one qubit she can effectively transfer two bits of classical information that is why we call it super dense coding so the requirement is they need a bell state before so they prepare a bell state phi 0 0 plus 1 1 by root 2 which means upon measurement you get either 0 0 0 or 1 1 with a probability of 50% so case 1 suppose alice want to send 0 0 she does nothing don't do anything just send the qubit to bob 
And Bob does the measurement after receiving it. Now Bob has all his classical information. Here, what you need to send is classical information, but what she's sending is quantum information. Difference is, want to send two bits of classical information, but she's sending only one bit of quantum information. So this one bit of quantum information will carry two bits of classical information because they already share a bell pair. So it is like this, an identity matrix. And you just need to recall the working of Hadamard gauge, which is given in the previous slides, which you can do as an exercise. It's straight, the maths is pretty much straightforward. Now, case two, if Alice wants to send 0, 1, what she has to do is she just need to apply the Z gauge. The Z gauge just inverts it and then send the qubit to Bob. And when Bob measures it, it becomes 0 and 1. Case 3, when Alice wants to send 1, 0, Alice applies X gate or the NOT gate. And again, when Bob measures it, and when Bob applies the measurement, his qubit becomes 1, 0, which is the classical bit which Alice intended to send. Again, if she wants to send 1, 1, she has to apply first Z gate and X gate and send the qubit to Bob. So basically, that shows superdense coding. So prepare and share a bell pair. That is the initial requirement. Then you send encode bits and the receiver measures it. So that is the most basic type of the quant I mean, quantum communication. Quantum teleportation as well as superdense coding. One is the reverse of the other. One uses classical information to transfer quantum information, while the other uses quantum information to transfer classical information. And you can clearly see what is the advantage. Now comes one of the very practical uses of uh, quantum communication. It is called BB84 protocol, which is the first uh, quantum communication protocol historically. And this one actually happened here, here in the sense, in the Institute of Science. Bennett and Buzzard, uh, they arrived in IAC in 1984 to present in the 75th anniversary of IAC. There was an atypical conference. And in that conference, they first presented this paper. And just like that, nobody paid any, paid any attention to it because everyone thought it was some kind of mathematical exercise or some kind of a practical job. But years later, this started a new branch of engineering or technology, which we, we right now we dub as the future of the technology. So BB is for Bennett and Buzzard, and 84 is the 1984, the year which they proposed it. Let's see how it works. It's a video which I uh, taken from the uh, YouTube, which actually explains it in a much more detailed version. Uh, can you hear the sound or? I don't think I can hear the chat. Uh, no, we can't. Okay, fine. Then I doesn't matter. I will explain it. Okay. So here you have two parties, Alice and Bob. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. I need to drag it. And they want to communicate between them some secret information. And just like that, there is somebody in between an eavesdropper who tries to steal the information, whatever Alice wants to send to Bob. So how does Alice and Bob transfer information without Eve getting to know what they're communicating? So what they have between them is a classical channel as well as a quantum channel. So the quantum channel, they through the quantum channel, they can send qubits. And through the classical channel, they can send classical bits. Now we have to assume that the eavesdropper is so powerful, has access to every modern technology, that she can eavesdrop into the classical channel as well as the quantum channel. So the task before Alice and Bob is to develop a protocol so that eavesdropper doesn't get to know what they're communicating. So let us see how they does it. So normal case, if they transfer information through the classical channel, what the eavesdropper will do, she will just break into it, just copy the bits, just read the bits, make a copy and transfer it to the sender, to the Bob. This can also happen in the quantum channel. She can break into the quantum channel, but there is a crux here. We will see what it is. Okay. So here, to implement the protocol, what they need is two machines, say machine A and machine B, which does process A and process B. So machine A, let us say process A, it generates uh, qubits 1 and 0. 
machine B also generates qubits, 1 and 0, through another process. So what, uh, what is the peculiarity of this is, this processor are different, but the qubits are identical. Which means, if you see a qubit, you cannot say if the qubit came from the process A or if the qubit came from process B. That is, the qubits produced by machine A and machine B are identical. And both machines can produce qubit 1 and qubit 0. So, now, Bohm will also have a counterpart of Alice machines. Bohm will also have a machine A and machine B. But what differentiates is, again, uh, Bob cannot, if you see a machine, they cannot identify from which uh, qubit, the, from which machine the qubit came from. If you see the qubit, they cannot identify from which machine the qubit came from. So the peculiarity of the Bob's machine is, let us say Bob machine A, consider Bob's machine A. Imagine uh, Bob received the qubit from Alice machine A. Bob is putting it into his machine A, it will give exactly the same result or it will measure the qubit exactly. Suppose uh, Alice sends qubit 1 from machine A, Bob's machine A will give you the result 1. If Alice sends a qubit 0 from her machine A, Bob's machine A will give you the result 1. But if mistake, Bob put it into his machine B, it will give the result 0 or 1 with equal probability. That is 50 percent probable. That is, if Alice is producing qubit 0 from her machine A and Bob is putting that qubit into his machine B, the output can be either 0 or 1 with equal probability or the output is randomized and vice versa. If Alice sends a uh, machine from machine B and Bob puts it into machine A, again the output is randomized. So that is the uh, particular crux in this operation. So now the protocol starts. Uh, what Alice does is, Alice has a set of information which has to be sent to Bob. So she has to convert information to qubits and then now she has to make qubits and then send it to Bob. And to make qubits she has two machines, machine A and B. And how will she choose which machine? And this choice is made randomly. She takes a fair coin and tosses it. If the coin lands on head, she will choose machine A and will pick the uh, qubit from machine A. If the coin lands on tail, she will choose machine B and picks the qubit from machine B and puts this qubit into the quantum channel and sends it to Bob. And she will record this coin tosses, like which machine did she chose in every uh, clock cycle. And that is with Alice. Bob has no access to that till now. So Bob is receiving qubits through the quantum channel. So what Bob can do? Bob will also take a coin, a fair coin, and will make it coin toss. When his coin lands on head, he will choose machine A. When the coin lands on tail, he will choose machine B. And this has to be agreed. If head is on, if we are getting head, we will choose machine A. If it is tail, we will choose machine B. That has to be agreed earlier. So Bob also makes a coin toss and choose the machine accordingly. Now by simple uh, probability tells us that 50% of the time, Bob's machine, Bob is going to be correct, right? 50% of the time, Bob is going to be correct because the machine toss, machine coin, the coin toss will be overlapping. Now, what about the other 50%? Bob puts into the wrong machine. Again, the rule of probability says that the, even if it goes to a wrong machine, 50% of the time, it is still correct. So the accuracy of the coding is 75%. Okay. So once the entire transmission happens, entire quantum information which Alice wanted to send to Bob is completely transmitted. Now what she does is, she has the recording of the coin tosses. Imagine that coin tosses is something like some 10,000 or 1 lakh or some huge number because she transmitted some 1 lakh bits or 10,000 bits or some big number. She just compromises a part of that. That is, we'll take the first 100 bits. Uh, is the presentation visible now? Oh no, the screen is uh, showing stop. Okay. Uh,
Okay. So, once the counter communication is over, say uh, Alice has transmitted like one lakh bits, she compromises a part of that, say hundred bits or thousand bits, like ten percent of it. She publishes her coin tosses. Okay, and Bob can compare with his coin tosses, or instead of publishing, she can transmit it over Bob, and Bob can compare which are the clock cycles when the coin tosses exactly matched, and they can discard the other coin tosses. I mean, they were the coin tosses did not match, and just take the information where the classical, I mean, the communication matches, and that's how the protocol works. So, what is so great in it? Now, consider the scenario. When somebody eavesdrops into it, the eavesdropper or Eve is stealing their information. See. Now, what does Eve needs to steal the information? We know that unknown classical bits, cannot, unknown quantum bits, cannot be cloned. That is, Eve cannot clone the uh, Alice quantum bit without measuring it. To measure it, once you once you measure it. The class quantum bit is destroyed. Destroyed in the sense it becomes a classical bit. So when the communication is broken in between, Bob can guess that okay somebody has sneaked in. So if Bob shouldn't guess it, or Bob if Bob has, should have no clue about someone has sneaking into it, what Eve has to do? She has to recreate the quantum information and send it to Bob. But she cannot copy the unknown qubit. So she she must have. The Eve should have Alice machine A and machine B, as well as Bob's machine A and machine B. Bob's machine A and machine B to receive Alice qubits, and Alice machine A and B to replicate them and send it to Bob. Let's say how she receives it. The same way as Bob receives it, she also have to choose a coin, may I mean take a coin, fair coin, and do the coin tosses, and. Uh, Put the qubit into corresponding machines and record the. I mean, what is it? Record the results as well as her coin tosses. Now, once she measures it, it is destroyed. Now she has to make the qubit, and again to make the qubit, she she need to have two machines, A and B. And how will she choose between A and B? She has no access to Alice coin, so she has to choose another. Again, she has to choose the fair coin, and she has to choose between machine A and machine B. And again, she has to record it. And now Bob receives qubits from Eve, not from Alice. And when Alice publishes her coin tosses, Bob's coin tosses are not going to match. Why? Because Bob's coin tosses can only match with Eve's coin tosses. So now, when they compare between the coin tosses and the quantum information in the corresponding coin tosses, they know that somebody has sneaked in between. So here we uses the property of no cloning theorem, as well as the superposition theorem. So that's how BB84 protocol prevents the intrusion of an eavesdropper into the communication channel. So that's it. Just like I said, when the protocol is implemented, 50% of time it goes to right machine, 50% of time it goes to the wrong machine. But when, uh, even if it goes to a wrong machine, we know that 75% of the time, Bob is going to be right. But if if get in in between, now the comparison is between Alice coin, I mean Bob's coin toss as well as Eve's coin tosses. Now it is not 75 percent, but it is going to be 62.5 percent. But regarding the security of communication, we don't need to worry about these figures. We just need to know that if one bit is compromised, that means somebody else has sneaked into it. So that's how the key matches. So this is the first type of protocol which was implemented in quantum communication. By using the property of no cloning theorem and superposition, I will send the slide. Uh, I will uh, give you the YouTube uh, link, video link also. So now, coming to implementing this in the lab, if you think machine A and machine B as two polarizers and the qubits as photons, imagine the qubit is a photon, and imagine the machine A as Machine A and Machine B as polarizers. One is horizontal and vertical, and one is diagonal. The whole thing translates into an optical implementation of quantum bits. This is actually this is how actually BB84 protocol was implemented in the lab. 
So if you are not familiar with the optics of for, or the polarization of light and how the polarizers work, you don't need to worry. This is how the protocol works. Here, one and zero tran I mean, translates to different polarization of the protocols. I mean, the polarization of the photons. Sorry. So in our lab, we try to implement this using a integrated optics. I mean, in a chip level. So this is schematic. So here we actually use in uh, source and detector and a random number generator instead of a coin. And the uh, input and output data was uh, using a optical fiber. And this is only a schematic. We are still not in, I mean, we haven't fabricated it, but uh, we have de designed and simulated the device. And also, uh, we tried to, and we have developed a higher dimensional version of the BB84 protocol in our lab uh, in 2016. In, in where, instead of qubits, we use qubits. So any, any generic qubit can be transferred using uh, the BB84 protocol. And while talking about the implementation part, we chose the, I mean, when, when implementing in a circuit, we just can't go with an arbitrary number. We need to fix some value for D. So in the op integrated op circuit, we chose a value 4. As I had, I mean, when Q ditch the value D equal to 4. And on the right side, you see the circuit for implementing a higher dimensional BB84 protocol with value D. This are published, these are published papers, and I can send you the link later. And this is a uh, new work which we are we are doing right now. Uh, it's in collaboration with an Australian team. It's a highly, it's a bit of advanced type of protocol. Uh, the development of protocol is a bit. Uh, uh, math, it's a bit uh, highly mathematical. I'm not going in detail to that, but again, I can give the link of the paper. So what we do is here, we use a particular state known as W state, which is given as 1 by root 3, 1, 0, 0, plus 1, 0, 0, plus 0, 0, 1. So here, uh, by using a quantum Fourier transform, we translate the logical qubit to W states, and then we apply errors, a random phase errors into it, and by using an inverse Fourier transform, we can say that whether the error has affected the qubit or whether has, or the, the noise, the random noise has affected the qubit or not. This protocol was developed by an Australian team. And in collaboration with them, we have developed the qubit version of the W state encoding. So that is the W state encoding for qubits. Again, the logical qubit is passed into a QFT which uh, the output is a W state encoded state. And we introduce random phase errors into it, non-correlated phase errors into it. And after the errors are introduced, again, the inverse Fourier transform gives us, tells us that whether the errors have corrupted the quantum information or not. The application, uh, what we see for this is, these phase errors are the most common type of errors in quantum communication when it happens through optical fibers or any other media, like any thermal fluctuations or any external fluctuations, any, ex any external factors, they always introduce the type of errors known as phase errors. So this particular encoding, which is straightforward to implement, they can actually I mean, error detect and correct all the type of external errors like thermal fluctuations. Also, they, I mean, for long distance quantum communication, and also for quantum memories. So like when a qubit is stored in a quantum memory for a long time, the fluctu thermal fluctuations and some external factors, they can corrupt the memory. So we see the application of this encoding in quantum memories and quantum communication. We're also developing uh, the next state of this, that is, uh, instead of inputting one logical qubit or one logical qubit, we consider multiple logical qubits and multiple logical qubits. Advantage is that instead of quantum communication or a quantum memory, that particular scheme can error correct an entire quantum computing process. That protocol is under development right now. And right now, we are also in the process of testing this protocol. So how do we test this? We, we have another collaboration with the Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad, where uh, we use we encode the quantum information into the orbital angular momentum of photons and perform this uh, operation. The advantage of the experimental scheme which we have chosen is, in one single experiment, we can uh, error correct qubits as well as qubits by, uh, ma uh, by manipulating the spatial light modulators. The experiment is currently ongoing, and I am not in a liberty to explain more details of the experiment because it is still in the running stage. And that's a, uh, I mean, a photo of the experimental setup. Not completely, only partial one. And once the experiment is complete, uh, we'll do the publication and then you can read more about it. 
So having said those about quantum communication protocols, now we come to quantum key distribution. This is actually the only mature technology in the field of quantum communication because this is the technology right now being implemented in the industry. This is finally the first techno quantum technology to be in the industry, quantum key distribution. <laughs> So as you know, in cryptography, especially in private key cryptography, where the two parties, Alice and Bob, use a private key to encrypt the data and transmit information. The challenge is how you transmit the key without the other third person knowing it. The first type of QKD is what we just right now saw, the BB84. That is basically QKD. You're transmitting the key between Alice and Bob without letting the eavesdropper steal information. So QKD systems are developed from there. Uh, later in 92, Arthur Eckert modified the protocol by using entangled qubits instead of single qubits. This is known as E92 protocol. And right now, E92 protocol is being implemented uh, as a testing for QKD. So in QKD, the sending unit, Alice, it will have a signal source, a random number generator, a signal modulation, and control electronics. And again, it will be sent to a classic quantum channel, which will be the, the receiving unit, or the Bob, it will demodel the signal, the signal detectors, the control electronics and random number generator. The random number generator is nothing but the coin, which we uh, said earlier. So in the example, we can talk about fair coin, but in real circuit implementation, we have to use a random number generator. And again, the control electronics, uh, we need to use the classical channel. So that is a generic form of quantum key distribution. And this is being implemented in various forms in various industries in different stages. So. Once you have quantum memories, quantum key distribution, quantum communication, quantum computer, obviously what follows is the quantum internet. Just like you can communicate over internet, a quantum internet, which is based on quantum repeated technologies, they can allow them to share entanglement, which means every single person need not have an access to a full-fledged quantum computer. Instead, if a quantum link is there enough, they can share the resource, that is, they can share the entanglement, which allow them to communicate securely. I think the next talk by Professor Peter Rodi, he will explain more into details in, about quantum internet. So what I'm giving is just an introduction to that. So the next stage was quantum satellites. That is the same QKD experiments of the quantum state trans I mean, communication is right now happening between Earth and space, I mean, from the low Earth orbit. So in 2016, China launched the first satellite known as QS, or Mishius one which transmitted information between China I and mean, Beijing and Shanghai and they have also made the first video call using the quantum link. Mm. Okay, I will answer the questions towards the uh, end of the presentation. So that is the uh, from the presentation which from the science by, uh, science magazine which the Chinese team presented. So this is how the quantum satellite works. Uh, on board the satellite, there is a quantum entanglement generation source. So the satellite, on board the satellite, they generate photon pairs, which are entangled. And these entangled pairs, they are transferred to different locations. So there is a circuit details, which they haven't given much in, not in much detail about the laser or the other components. So these are mostly quantum optics stuff. Yeah, there is 5.9 million entanglement pairs per second. That is actually the current data rate. Just been transmitted between 1,200 kilometers. Yeah, but again, even that is even though that is a data rate, this is a success rate. That is, out of 6 million photons, only one make it to stations. Because you're transmitting single photons from the space to the Earth, there is a lot of chances it get absorbed or destroyed. So that is the current data rate, what you have. So by this, they have transmitted a successfully transferred encryption key. And they have made a video call between Beijing and Vienna. And the next step is making another quantum satellite and do the satellite to satellite quantum communication. And which in future will result in a network of quantum satellites which can actually form the backbone of quantum internet a space based quantum internet so even though 
China successfully launched the first satellite. It was not China who actually thought about this in the beginning. It was the National University of Singapore, Professor Alexander Ling's group, started the work in 2011, actually. And I was part of the group in 2012. And we assembled the first optical uh, quantum satellite. And 2012, we tested it in a weather balloon, 500 kilo, I mean, 50 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And it was successful. So what you see in the left side is a photo of the the crude arrangement which we made in the lab, which was tested in a weather balloon. But uh, the CubeSat finally took off in 2016, or, and it got actually destroyed in the journey. The rocket blasted midway. So the next year, they were able successfully they launched the satellite in 2017, and it's still working. So the advantage of the Singapore satellite is it is only the size of a shoebox. It's a very small one, very low cost and cheap one, but like less sophisticated than the Chinese satellites. So that is uh, the Singapore satellite. It has a quantum key generator, which sends entangled photons between two locations, Alice and Bob. So they transfer the encryption key. If somebody destroys in between, again, by, I mean, this uses the same BB, BB92 protocol, which is the advanced version of uh, BB84 protocol, where they used entangled pairs instead of single photons. So the error rate is somewhere in the order of less than 10 percentage. So that is a limitation of quantum communication. So China and Singapore are not the only uh, people who are actually trying to do it. Jap Japan has already uh, plans to launch satellites on Socrates. And Europe has already launched retro reflector satellites, which, is, which works actually in collaboration with the International Space Station. So they launch it from the ISS, and the satellite communicates with ISS for quantum communication. And Canada is uh, already testing quantum encryption and science satellite known as QSAT. It's nothing but a photon source and a detector. But still, uh, uh, I think they have successfully launched it recently. And India is building the ISRS quantum satellite. You are yet to name it. So uh, coming to the end of the talk, so there is a book which being released in, by in December, published by Cambridge University Press. It is edited by Professor Peter Rodi. And there are nine co-authors. And I am one of the co-authors of the book. So the book will be released in 2000, uh, th this year by December. And the e-copy of the book will be free, because we have made the arrangement with the uh, Cambridge University Press to distribute the soft copy freely. So once the book is released from that website, you can download a free copy. So I request everyone to have a look at it. And we have designed the book in such a way that there is a technical as well as non-technical part. So that every person can get something from the, from the book. I think Peter will talk more about the book later in this talk. So that comes towards the end of my talk. And just acknowledging the people whom I work with, Professor Srinivas, my supervisor, and Dr. Gopal Hegde, uh, my collaborator, Aravind Balaji Ravichandran, my colleague, and P Peter Rodi, my collaborator and co close friend, Madhav Krishnan, Peter's student, and Austin Lunch, Peter and my collaborator, and Professor R.P. Singh's lab. They are carrying out the experiment on W stage. And uh, Dr. Nigel, Lal, Nigel, and, uh, Nigel is from the Professor R.P. Singh's laboratory, and we jointly designed the experiment to test the w state protocol. And Sariga Mishra is a, our experimentalist who is actually in charge of the experiments. And India Banerjee was part of the R.P. Singh's lab. Uh, I mean, uh, and we designed the experiment together, and right now he moved to Center for Quantum Technology Singapore. Okay, that's the end of the talk, and if you have any doubts, we can have the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rohit, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I learned a lot, and I hope everyone had a good time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, right now is a good time to ask. You can either unmute yourself or type in the chat box. Yep, please. Oh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Excellent talk. Uh, I would like to ask you about the data rate. I mean, first of all, it's a data rate or the photons we can transmit per second. I don't have any idea. Please say something. Yeah, I mean, again, in the video which we have uh, seen, the data, I mean, the number of photons which can be trans uh, transmitted 
uh, per rate is different from the actual data which we can transfer. Because again, there will be a lo lot of loss of photons. And I'll have to check to the latest literature. And sorry to say, I don't have exact the exact value right now. But I can get back to you regarding the uh, versus data rate. OK, thank you. Yeah, two more people have asked. So can you go, sir? Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're talking about the data rates. Uh, isn't uh, like uh, the uh, free space communication, in case of free space communication, the uh, data rate is less than that uh, we can do through optical channels? Of course. I mean, uh, the right now, the quantum communication data rate is nowhere comparable to the classical communications data rate. Uh, no, I'm talking about uh, the uh, it's like different. It's different quantum in communication in case of uh, through these uh, fibers, actually, not through the free space. Like we have well defined channels. Yeah, I mean, fiber mm -hmm. data rate is much more higher than the uh, uh, free space one. And I don't have, I don't remember the exact figures right now, but I can get back to you. That. Uh, also, I wanted to ask. Uh, yep. Like in case of Q rates, I had done a little bit of work in that, and there I found that uh, the whole uh, the chi rate, the uh, chi uh, number actually that we get channel capacity, hmm. it it depends on uh, the dimension d, like like uh, d yep. of the Hilbert space, yes. and it decreases significantly with increasing d. Yes, it is highest for Q rates. So, what is the physical reason behind it? Uh, well, I'm not. Uh, I don't know about the physical reason behind it, but as you said, there is a hollow bound. But the protocol, what we have developed, is actually trying to uh, find the limitations for that. Like we just we don't have exactly to what level uh, in in practical implementations. Like if we increase the value of d, to what level it decreases. So that is what we are trying to find it experimentally. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, hi Rohit, this is Tilak. Uh, right. It's a great talk. Uh, thanks for putting all the all the great effort. So, uh, in in the initial slides, you told uh, photonics are one of the way using photons are one of the way for the quantum communication, right? You also yeah. told about gravitation waves. So, I'm kind yeah. of curious on the gravitation waves because the LIGO detectors that we have in Caltech or the, the one being planned in India, they have a lot of uh, complexity in terms of detection detecting the gravitation waves. Yeah. So, I'm kind of curious on how we could use that. To, for the content communication, also, uh, also after the gravitation waves, what do you think on using the 6G uh, terahertz wave communication? I think some of the authors are present here. Mr. Neil um, has worked on it. Uh, maybe you guys could throw some perspective on using these alternative ways of uh, medium for the content communication, uh, how it would be in the future. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, see, actually, uh, what I like I said. Uh, there are different uh, we can choose different parameters like uh, different medium for communicate in quantum communication provided the medium has the quantum properties which satisfy the requirements of our quantum communication equipment which we want to employ so gravitational wave is a candidate because it has the quantum properties but how to use that because i am not an expert in that area so i cannot comment on that also like i work on photonics so that's the reason why i can say only about photonics but there are other methods and if you talk about the technology uh, we are not in a position to predict which is going to be the final winner in this technological race. Only I can say that photonic technology is right now much advanced than the other technology. So that other technology has to catch up. That doesn't mean that photonic technology is the answer of answer to the quantum communication problem. We still have a lot of uh, issues to be resolved. And maybe in future, some other, uh, I mean, some other technology, as you like gravitational wave technology or something else, or even superconducting uh, qubits. They are the the new, I mean, what new have the, they're the new interest in the area, which are giving a lot of very uh, quality results, very high quality results. So we cannot, we are not in a position to exactly predict which is which technology is going to be the final winner. But in quantum communication, photonics is right now much advantageous than any others because it has been experimentally proven and it has been experimentally proven to the level which no other technology has achieved. Uh, regarding how gravitational waves can be used for quantum communication, uh, I am not the expert to, and I am not the person to answer that, because it's not my area of expertise. Uh, sure, sure. Thank you. Thanks for answering that. 
uh, we yeah, have so, so, uh, somebody has to ask a question in the chat box yeah. can we could we incorporate quantum communication topics in our normal academic topics while doing normal ug or pg it could cultivate more and more future workforce towards quantum in future yes i think we should incorporate more and more uh, because the technology is getting more importance and it is getting seriously getting implemented but like uh, the prerequisites are uh, not quantum physics but linear algebra and then comes quantum physics for the subject and if you are talking about the implementation part i would suggest photonics but as i said at this moment we cannot exactly say photonics is going to be the final winner so that part we have to give a little bit of thought but i think yes it is time that we have introduced quantum information in at least pg level courses but thanks for that question yeah agash uh hi sir uh, first of all it was a very nice talk uh, thanks for that uh, i am an undergrad and at my university we are planning to make a small satellite so i would like to have some guidance of what kind of quantum information project we can inculcate in that at undergrad level yeah you can contact me later i mean uh, you can contact for the organizers for the email id uh, we can have this discussion offline Sure, sir. Uh, just uh, leave me a message on Slack. Uh, uh, direct message. I'll get back to you. Okay. Pravin, I can send you the slides by uh, in another one hour. I just need to add uh, yeah, few sure. references. That's all. Sure. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Uh, if no other questions, uh, I think this concludes today's uh, third lecture. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending this lecture, and uh, thanks a lot to uh, uh, Mr. Rohit for uh, the wonderful presentation again. Uh, so uh, we will meet again at four o'clock for the tutorial session. Uh, so uh, I will end the meeting right now. If no one else has any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank one, you. For one, just one second. Can you uh, like switch on your video? This is ready to take a screenshot. Also, stop I'm sharing. trying. I'm trying to join, but it's not working. Out. I don't know. Uh, stop sharing. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, maybe stop presenting. Oh, still, it's not working. I don't know why. It's, it's working. Wait, wait, hang on. Let me try in my other other system. Is the other attendee wishes yeah. to switch on your video? You can. It's in the lab. It's in the lab. So the lighting it's, is not oh, that okay. good. Okay. Okay. It's it's all good. Yeah. yeah the okay. lighting is not good. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, taking the screen. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you for uh, attending this lecture. Uh, I will see you for tutorial at four o'clock.